Good evening, and thank you for joining us at this Northshire Presents event, presented in partnership with our good friend at, friends at the King's English Bookshop. Thank you so much to all of you for being here tonight and for your incredible support of independent bookselling. All of us at both Northshire and the King's English really appreciate the loyalty and support of customers like you, and we couldn't present events like this one without you. So thank you so very, very much. Before my colleague David uh, introduces our authors this evening, a very quick logistical note. If you have any questions throughout the evening, please put them into the Q&A box that you will find at the bottom of your, of your screen. Um, we will save those up and we will pose them for you at the end of the evening. We'll get to as many audience questions as we can at that time. So please uh, put those questions into that Q&A box and we will ask them for you later on. David, why don't you go ahead and introduce our authors? Thank you so much, Rachel. Well, it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce Simon Winchester for his new book, Knowing What We Know transmission of knowledge from ancient wisdom to modern magic. The New York Times says the Knowing What We Know is a book about transmitting knowledge by someone who has made his name by doing just that in the most erudite and entertaining way possible. At the delightful compendium of the kind of facts you immediately want to share with anyone you encounter, Winchester has firmly earned his place in history as a promulgator of knowledge of every variety perhaps the last of the famous explorers who crisscrossed the now vanished British empire and reported what they found to an astonished world. He is the acclaimed author of many books, including The Professor and the Madman, The Men Who United the States, The Map That Changed the World, The Man Who Left China, A Crack in the Edge of the World, Krakatoa, and Land, all of which were New York Times bestsellers and appeared on numerous best and notable lists. In 2006, Winchester was made an officer of the Order of the British Empire by Her Majesty the Queen. He resides in Western Massachusetts, um, and we are very lucky to be joined tonight by Brian Michael Murphy, a media archaeologist, essayist, poet, and the current Dean of the College at Bennington College, who will be joining the faculty of Williams College next year. He is the author of the Northshire Staff Pick, one of my own, and in fact, my favorite nonfiction book of 2022, We the Dead, Preserving Data at the End of the Century. Please join me in welcoming back to Northshire, Brian Michael Murphy and Simon Winchester. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. And uh, thank you, Simon, for this conversation ahead of time. I must say that I really, really enjoyed the book, but I won't go on too long about that. I'll just sprinkle compliments throughout and try to make you blush. So we'll see how I do. Um, I'm doing to, it already, so thank you. <laughs> but to start, can you tell us how this book originated? Did it build upon topics or fragments you explored in other book projects and expand them? Or was there a moment when you just knew that this was going to be a book length project? There was a moment really, and it stemmed from the previous book that I had done, which was about the history of the ownership of land. And someone just said to me casually, so how much did you use Google and Wikipedia to do this book? And because most of the research had to be conducted while during the pandemic. I didn't travel much and I did indeed use online sources to a very large extent. And this person, it was a conversation over a beer one evening, did the overuse or at least the liberal use of these things damage in any way my brain, my ability mm. to think, if you like. And I thought that was actually a good question. And by extraordinary coincidence, like later in the day, I think it was later in the same day, I was reading some passages from a T.S. Eliot poem called The Rock, which I actually then used as an epigraph for this book, which had three sort of memorable, I think rather profound lines. What is this life we have lost in living? Hmm. What is this wisdom we have lost in knowledge? What, if this, what is this knowledge we have lost in information? In other words, if we're swamped by information, then we can't sort of filter out the knowledge. If we're swamped with knowledge, maybe it's impossible to be wise. And if we're dealing all the time with the details of living, we forget what life is all about. Three rather profound lines, I mean, typically T.S. Eliot. Mm -hmm. And so the coincidence of those two things made me think, you know, there's possibly a book here. But what I didn't want to do was to write a book which in any way made homage to the science of epistemology, because I think mm. that's the most boring word imaginable. So I, did, I think I'm true to my vow not to use the word epistemology more than once in the book. <laughs> so it attempts to be a somewhat, I, I don't much like the word accessible, but I think you know what I mean, mm -hmm. um, a book about a complex subject, but rendered relatively 
accessible. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I definitely say you succeeded in that, and it's it's very engaging as well. Um, and it, it makes me think about you know how our brains work and how our brains actually filter out most of the information that's coming at them at any given time. So it's it makes sense that we'd be overwhelmed by all of this. Um, you know, one of the great things about the book is that you take us to all these different time periods uh, from the moment we're living in now back to ancient times, early modern times. It's, it's, all, it's all there. And what's striking sometimes is when you take us to a primary source, such as Robert Burns's The Anatomy of Melancholy from 1621, and there's this amazing passage that you that you cite um, where there's there's this cascade of topics because he says um i hear new news every day and there's ordinary rumors of war plagues fires i'm not going to read the whole thing but no but it is a wonderful passage robert burton the anatomy yeah. of Matt, Matt melancholy is absolutely superb and i read it and thought well that's today i mean that was written a long long while ago but it's exactly sure. the way there's this cascade of knowledge much of it, of course, not true, as we know, only to our cost these days. But yes, he was overwhelmed, and that's what T.S. Eliot was writing about, and that's sort of what I hope to be writing about, too. Sure. And then, on the one hand, drawing these connections and noting that this is not the first time that humans have felt awash in information overwhelmed by it, but then you also detail things that are perhaps unique about today or are perhaps somewhat new. Um, Obviously, the internet is a is a very young invention, and you talk a bit about that. We'll talk a little bit later about Chat GPT. We're going to wait, make people wait <laughs> um, to get there. But as I was reading, um, if we if we sort of stick in earlier times, I was thinking too about all of these key figures that you bring up. Um, these these polymaths or geniuses who, um, while we know that they are not the only reason that history moves the way that it does, they certainly do shape it. Um, it was really hard to figure out which ones to ask you about specifically because so <laughs> many were fascinating. Do you have one? Um, you know, you talk, talk about people like T.S. Eliot. There are also the the um, various inventors and mathematicians that you cite. Is there one that sort of stands out to you as being? more inspiring than the others or one who you feel like you return to in your mind more now that the book is done and maybe you're trying to push the book out of your mind and kind of no, I, 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 I mean if there is one I suppose and I find him so endearing a fellow who called Frank Ramsey mm. who died very young mm -hmm. but has probably had more things well first of all no one knows who he is except mm. specialists in the field of economics philosophy um linguistics where in all of these fields there is the Ramsey effect, the Ramsey mm -hmm. theorem, the Ramsey equation. He's tremendous. I mean, for a fellow who died, I think, in his late twenties, mm -hmm. and lived in the nineteen thirties, effectively, that's when he was at his his apogee. If that's the right one, I never remember which is apogee and perigee. But anyway, uh, he was just a lovable, lovable. I mean, profoundly insecure, but brilliant mm -hmm. man huge he, he was someone said he has a cart horse's bottom and sexually so innocent i mean he approached he had attempted to have an affair with the wife of a cambridge uh, engineer a, a professor called jeffrey pike who in himself was very interesting and he made a move um on but a very sort of clumsy and primitive cart horses move on mrs pike and she said, no, no, I don't want to sleep with you, but why don't you become godfather to my children? He said, oh, all right, that's an adequate substitute. And then Jeffrey Pike went on to invent this amazing substance called picrete. You can look it up in any dictionary. Mm -hmm. We've all forgotten what it was. But picrete was a mixture of ice and wood shavings, which was incredibly mm -hmm. strong. It doesn't sound mm -hmm. as if it would be, but it was. And they were going to build a 2,000 foot long aircraft carrier built, made of picrete put it in the middle of the Atlantic. This was the Royal Navy. I mean, serious mm. thinking was suggested that this might work. And it would melt slowly, but it would take several years to do so. But then wow. you'd have a huge landing strip in the middle of the ocean that bomb bombers could land and take. So one way, I mean, you, there are these little nuggets which keep appearing in the story, particularly accreting to people like, um, like uh, Frank Ramsey, but then Ramanujan, I mean, 
this Indian mm -hmm. mathematician who he also died very young, also at Cambridge actually, and brought over totally uneducated from South India, came at the behest of a very famous mathematician called G.H. Hardy to Trinity College, Cambridge. And then he got ill and effectively he was on his deathbed when Hardy came to visit him one day. And um, Hardy was a mathematician. Mm -hmm. And from his bed, Ramanujan said to Hardy, did you by any chance to see the number of your taxi? And Hardy said, oh, that's a very boring number. It was 1729. Uh, and Ramanujan said, that's not a boring number. That's, that is, I believe, the smallest number that is the sum of two cubes mm -hmm. in two different ways. One cube plus 12 cube plus or 10 cube plus nine cube, something like that. I mean, brilliant that he could get it in a microsecond. He wasn't a polymath. He didn't know much more than mathematics. Mm -hmm. But there are lots of interesting people in this book, but they're at the very end of the book, not at the beginning. Sure. Well, why don't we switch gears then to someone who, I don't know if they were ever called a polymath or a genius. Um, let's talk a bit about someone who did some math, and his name was James Usher, a 16th century oh. bishop in what is now Northern Ireland. Now, he added together, as you say, the generations laid out in a genealogy of Christ in the King James Version of the Bible and adding some what we would now call data points for some other ancient texts, he concluded that God created the world beginning uh, in the year 4004 BC. Not only that year, but specifically on Sunday, October 23rd of that year. Um, and this provides some comic relief. And, and it is sort of funny that people would think that, that they could calculate it this precisely, perhaps to some modern observ contemporary observers. Um, but I really love this example, and it's not just funny. But I think what's profound about it is that it's it speaks to what counts as knowledge at any given time. You're absolutely right. I mean, I uh, let me just add a little sure, bit sure. of angel dust to to that date, the 23rd of October, 4004 BC, the origin of the world, according to Russia. Um, that a, a fellow who went on to become Vice Chancellor of Cambridge University, we could be in Cambridge, not a bare time today, but nonetheless, that was a fact. And so he was obviously, I can't remember his name, obviously a very clever chap. He further refined Usher's calculations and declared that actually, yes, it was the 23rd of October, a Sunday, but it was at nine o'clock in the morning. So after God had finished his with a capital H breakfast, and I think that's a charming <laughs> thought. And that number, that date was in Bibles that were printed in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, you get Genesis 1, you know, in the beginning God, and on the left-hand side in rubric, in other words, it's scarlet ink, 29 or 23 October 4004. But the important point of your question is that this, this kind of knowledge is belief-based knowledge, is faith-based knowledge, mm -hmm which we rationalists, post-enlightenment rationalists, would think is nonsense, because mm -hmm. we know, you know, geologists know it's nothing like 4 double you know, 6,000 years ago, much, much longer than that. But the interesting point is, I think anyway, uh, after finishing this book, is that because so much of what we declare to be knowledge today is so flawed in one way or another, we don't believe our newspapers, we don't believe our television, mm -hmm. these are vehicles for transmitting knowledge, we don't believe Wikipedia necessarily. We perhaps believe it more than we did when Jimmy Wales founded it. Then maybe belief, flawed though it may be, because nonsense like Usher's uh, declaration sort of pepper it, it has endured. Mm. Belief, I mean, we live in 2023, which is after all a belief based mm. year dated from the birth of this chap who lived who were born in Bethlehem all these year, years ago. So crediting belief-based system, it's like being, what do you trust most or least? Do you trust Fox News, Wikipedia, Britannica, the London Library, British Museum on one hand, or two and a half thousand years of religious belief? Both of them are seeming to some people anyway, to have equal validity, which means to me anyway, that it, this may result if knowledge, reality-based knowledge, becomes further degraded, mm -hmm. trusted less, people may find themselves turning back to 
religion. And that would be interesting to say the least. Sure, sure. Um, well, speaking of newspapers, um, one, uh, one of the parts of the book that um, really stood out is um, a section where you really quickly move through all the different monikers that newspapers have chosen for themselves over the past few hundred years. And I'm sure it's not even all of them, but it, it feels pretty comprehensive, but I'm sure there's, there's many, many more. Um, as someone who lives in Vermont now, I really love that section because I think we have about 45 of those words represented. We have the, the banner here in Bennington and the, the beacon on campus and the, um, the blotter, there's the digger, the reformer. Um, in any case, just... I mean, I like the one that was in Prince Edward Island in Canada. I forget the name of the paper, but the slogan is covers Prince Edward Island like the dew. Oh yes, it's beautiful. <laughs> Poetic, right? um, so, so this question, I guess, is a bit a bit personal, but I'm wondering after you've written this book about all these different ways that humans come upon the knowledge they have, I'm wondering how do you get your news? Oh, I religiously read religious theory. I see. I'm incorporating the word into what I'm talking about. <laughs> I go first of all every day to the New York Times, much to the chagrin of my wife, who doesn't believe a word in the New York Times. And then I go to, to see deliberately the opposite end of the spectrum, the most popular English language online newspaper in the world, which is the London Daily Mail. And for which for two years of which I'm heartily ashamed, I actually worked back in the 1980s. Horrible newspaper edited by horrible people, but incredibly well edited. And so you're compelled to read it. So I read the Times for serious, what I believe is serious and almost newspaper record type news. And um, then I read uh, the Daily Mail for, for the rubbish and what other people are reading and accepting as the truth, but in very large, um, to a very large degree is not true. Mm -hmm. And then I additionally, I read my local paper, which is the Berkshire Eagle. And, and then I created a newspaper in the little village that I live in in Berkshire County called the Sandisfield Times, mm -hmm. which has now existed for 14 years. Other big newspapers have crashed like uh, dead redwood trees, but the Sandisfield Times, plug here, sandisfieldtimes.org, mm -hmm. is online. It's also we distributed in hard copy. Everyone in town reads it. And mm -hmm. the, it's an extraordinary thing is that when I came to Sandisfield 20 years ago, no one went to the town meetings. The number of people that voted in town elections was minimal. We started this newspaper, which initially everyone hated, thought, you know, you just got some bloke from England coming talk to, you know, created a newspaper, what pompous idiocy. But now everyone reads it and the mm. town meeting is filled with people and huge numbers of people turn up at the elections. So mm. democracy speaks in Sandersfield. That's amazing. That's amazing. I, I'd, I'd love to linger a bit on this newspaper topic and, and break into this, this broader topic of printing and uh, not so much the origins of printing, which you helpfully, you know, tell us in many ways. We we go back to Gutenberg, but you really have to look to China to look at some of the origins of these things. But um, when I think about that the revolution that occurred that you detail so well, where uh, paper and printing came together in the time of Gutenberg, um, one of the things that that stood out to me as I read was economics and how much Gutenberg himself had to consider how he was going to make money on this glorious Bible that he was going to print. And I wonder if in researching this book and in writing this book, how does that shape the way you see what's going on in the publishing industry now? There are these seismic shifts, there are consolidations, there are, there are readers saying that the, the evil corporations are preventing real art from getting published because all they care about is money. And, and I'm reading this Gutenberg thing, I said, well, seems like money has kind of always been there in this business. It's not to say there isn't anything to these, these challenges to the publishing industry, but I'm just wondering, uh, how, how do you see all of this? And, and you see continuities, do you see discontinuities going all the way back to Gutenberg? What's, what's your lens for this? Well, um, I, what I would say is that with Gutenberg in Europe, mainland Europe and Caxton in England, um, all of a sudden news information was commodified. It had to be mm. because the people that were distributing it had to earn a living. And so Gutenberg, I mean, you're quite right, it was formidably expensive to, to print those hundreds of copies of this extraordinary piece of art, this Bible. 
it had to be pre-sold and so even the Bible was being commodified, but it meant that back in 897 or whenever the Diamond Sutra was printed in China, a Buddhist text, it was deliberately printed for free distribution. So the Chinese, the early Chinese and then the later Korean printers did it with no hope of either reward or sustaining a life for themselves, the printers. But once the Europeans, once we white folk, if you like, got into the game, then we said, well, we can make money out of this. And of course, the moment money is introduced, then there's the potential for the news or whatever you're publishing being somehow tailored, mm. nudged to make it more popular. And so you get potentially, not all newspapers felt were guilty of this, uh, potential for distortion and manipulation and all the rest of it. And I, I sort of mourn the passing of what a brief attempt to have newspapers be newspapers of record. I mean, the first newspaper in New York City, where I'm speaking from today, was simply information. It was the, the, the what was it called, the Daily Commerce or something. And it just recorded the inbound and outbound ships in Newport Harbor. So you knew whether to go and bid on some wheat that had arrived or mm. whatever. But then proprietors and newspapers realized that you could make the newspaper popular by writing a salacious story about a, a, a murder or some sort of crime or something. And then as far as the newspaper barons, and of course some people became extremely wealthy and powerful. Um, then you got you know, people like William Randolph Hearst and Citizen Kane and all that. And so our newspapers are the press, the best source of information, which is a question that pops up again and again. Newspapers are record, it used to be the London Times, no longer. The New York Times, I still think tries to be, but we have so many scandals have rocked the Times in the last decade that we doubt it. Le Monde, Le Monde Diplomatique, uh, Die Zeit in Berlin. They're still newspapers of record to a degree, but it's a, they walk a very fine line between commerce and strict, just give me the facts, man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So going back, you took us pretty far back to these origins of printing that we're not concerned about money. Um, and as I was reading, I was thinking about how so many of us know the name of Thomas Edison. Um, we know these all these inventors' names, but um, I don't hear a lot about the inventor of paper. So it was interesting to read in your book. Could you could you tell me a bit about this person who? comes upon this idea. How does how does this person come upon this idea to make paper? Um, what was it that sparked this, this inspired yeah, well, thought? Well, oddly enough, it involves an animal which right at the beginning of this book caused me to learn the first thing I ever learned, because when I was two and three quarters, I think it was in the summer of 1947, I had come back from a shopping expedition with my mother in north of London and put my boot on and there was a wasp in it and it stung me and I howled and who carried on and I then now knew what pain was, at least wasp induced pain. Mm -hmm. And I knew what a wasp was. And I sort of, I probably in my little childish way, I thought as many people have thought subsequently, what is the point of a wasp? I mean, a bee, I can see it makes honey, but wasps do nothing but bad, except mm -hmm. not true. Mm -hmm. It is the wasp and the building of its nests that prompted a, I can never remember the century, but let's say, 6th century BC, something like that, Chinese chap called Kai Lun, to say, look at this fragile, gray, papery substance that the wasp has made its net, nest from. I'm sure if I apply a, a calligraphy brush to it very carefully, not making sure not to break it, I can write a Chinese character on it. And lo and behold, he could. Yeah. And he thought, well, let's wash, wash, sorry, watch these wasps and see how they do it. So he observed, we had colleagues observing what wasps did, and they flew around and uh, landed on trees and nibbled on the bark and leaves and bits of sort of masticable garbage and chewed it up and then spat it out and stamped on it with their little waspy feet and um, turned it into this substance out of which when it was dried, it made a nest, but which to Kai Lun, was something on which you could write. So if he did the same thing, gathered the same materials and added some water and mashed them up and mm. spread it out on grids of, uh, of bamboo, then it would turn into a large sheet 
mm. of something which, while still fragile, he could write upon. And so he was remains credited by both people in the East and the West. I mean, the Japanese say, well, we created better quality paper. Um, but anyway, the genie was out of the bottle. So Kailun, mixing metaphors here, but he let the genie of paper out of the bottle, the Japanese improved it, and then we in the West took it and ran with it and produced the kind of stuff that you can buy at Staples every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, an, it's a really an amazing story. Um, and I would like to linger there, but we have to get back into the time machine and barrel forward all the way back up to the present because uh, before we <laughs> run out of time, I have to ask you um, about, about one very, very contemporary topic. And so I was wondering as I was reading if you were going to discuss these recent developments in AI, including chat GPT, and you do so in what I thought was a very clear and clever way. And I won't spoil it, I'll let, I'll let people uh, get to that part of the book where you do a very clever thing, I thought. But let's say, imagine I was someone who tries to avoid computers. Clearly I'm not, but let's say I'm someone who tries to avoid computers. And I know there's something called the internet and there's something called Facebook that's being overtaken by something called TikTok. But generally it's all the same to me. It's just all more of the same. It's just something I don't want anything to do with. And what if I said to you that, Chat GPT is just more of the same. Computers and the internet have now been around for decades. Heck, as you point out in your own book, Vannevar Bush and Jorge Luis Borges were talking about the internet back in the 1940s. But now every few months, there's some news story or some commercial that says, no, 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 this, this is different. This is new. And what if I said, Chat GPT is just another hyped up thing that isn't new at all? What would you say to that? I would say that that's totally wrong. I mean, I. Yes, there's been a, a, ever since the electronic calculator was invented, an affordable calculator in 1967, there's been a linear progression of electronic devices, which have increasingly allowed us to put parts of our brain into cold storage, if you like. So we no, no longer need to calculate. We don't need to know how to spell. We don't need grammar. We don't need to know how to get from A to B. And we don't need to know anything because it's all there at the touch of the kind of screen that I could touch your nose at this moment and bring up all sorts of imaginable, unimaginable facts. So those things, and you very kindly mentioned Vannevar Bush, who predicted it all. Um, but now this, what OpenAI has produced in San Francisco using these large language models and has come up with this new thing, which we generally call chat GPT, with its various iterations is so completely different from everything. This is profoundly different and terrifying. I mean, I am no great admirer of um, Tom Friedman. I often think if bloviating was an Olympic sport, Thomas J. Friedman would win gold year after year at the Olympics. But he did this amazing column about a month, six weeks ago now, in which he looked at ChatGPT 4.0, oh. which produces things of stunning originality and real beauty. I mean, in this book, I kind of you not to give away my little secret, but I do get ChatGPT 3.5 to um, complete Shelley's poem, Ozymandias, my sort of favorite and something that I, like many people you I expect, know by heart, and give it the first two lines of what it then produced. Doesn't include the famous line, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings, look on my works, you mighty, and despair. It produces something equally beautiful, it has one grammatic mistake in it. It says it's got a line saying, I looked up at the sea. And it is not possible to look up mm. at the sea. You can only look down or across the sea. But that aside, and I'm sure that chat GPT 4.0 corrects that in a heartbeat. Um, it's produced something stunningly beautiful. And when, I mean, my editor, you know, we've both been in the book business for a long while. She looks at stuff that it produces and said, Simon, your, your days may, may be numbered because it can produce lyrically beautiful stuff. And someone, I mean, this is very flattering, said, write an essay in the style. I didn't think I have a style, but not in the style of Simon Winchester. Yeah. And it did. I mean, it produced something which my editor said, well, why do we need you? <laughs> well, I'm glad you're still here and so well, Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 
you tell a story uh, very late in the book where you're on an airplane having a conversation and your interlocutor makes a point that Americans, I believe he says, Americans confuse pleasure with happiness, um, which I thought was a pretty wise statement. And wisdom is a really key concept in the book. Um, if I wanted to take this wisdom to heart and really apply it in my life or just wisdom in general, the wisdom of the ages, if you will, if I wanted to gather some of this up and apply it, tell me what, what are my prospects for being able to do that as I find myself immersed in these screens and, you know, the average American is looking at them seven well, plus hours a day. Can, yeah. Are these things mutually uh, sort of exclusive? Can, do I have to stop one to do the other? How does this work? Well, I don't think so, actually. And I, I have this, maybe it's a cockamamie idea, but if you look at the, the great inte the intellectual giants of Greece, particularly, I mean, Plato, who after all is the man that defined knowledge, and the Socrates, who ethics, Aristotle, all manner of things, including what is the nature of um, you know, happiness, love, and so forth. And you add to those, you know, the mathematicians, Pythagoras, Euclid, Herodotus, geographer, take those six. Now they produce the building blocks of modern Western society in so many ways. Were they qualitatively more or less clever than the intellectual giants of today or recent times like Hannah Arendt or Bertrand Russell or Richard Feynman, the physicist? And I would argue that no, they weren't. That these chaps today are every bit as bright, but the difference is that the, the Greeks, their minds were far less cluttered. They, after all, they didn't know any language other than Greek. Though Aristotle, who went to Egypt, might have done. Uh, they didn't know any history because there wasn't much history to know, not much written history anyway. They knew precious little geography. They wouldn't know what we can easily know today, you know, the atomic weight of sodium or the capital of South Dakota or the principal figures in the Enlightenment. So each one of those was a, a tabula rasa, quite literally. They had, with their stupendous intellects, the purity to be able to think great thoughts, which they then did and been handed down to us in history, and they're regarded as wise figures. Mm -hmm. Richard Feynman, Bertrand Russell, Hannah Arendt, just to pick those out at random, were every bit as bright, but they knew hundreds and hundreds of things. Their minds were racing with all sorts of information, which, technically speaking, now that we know we don't need to know these things because it's all available at a touchscreen, it probably is unnecessary for them to clutter their brains with such mm. things. So I like to think of these, and I'm accepting GPT from this argument, but these labor set, these mind saving devices, as you like, it's a bit like holding our brains under a cold water tap and getting away all the stickiness, all the information like the capital of South Dakota for, I mean, who really needs, apart from people who live there, needs to know it's called Pierre and pronounced Pierre. Um, absent all that, then we might find that with their minds as great as the minds of the Greeks, we might find a 21st century Plato somewhere in the making who may think things equally great and unimaginable to us now because we can't possibly figure out what they might think. So wisdom may be brought back in strength into modern society. The University of Chicago has a center for practical wisdom that mm. thinks that wisdom can be taught to people. I'm not mm. sure whether that's true or not, but we might win it back if we let these devices purchase of the unnecessary information with which our minds are clogged. Awesome. That's a, I think that's a, that's a great place for us to uh, wrap up our conversation, but I know we have some questions. So thank you for all of that. I really appreciate it. Um, I know there's some questions from the audience, so I will pass the mic back over and thank we can move into those. Thank you so much, Brian and Simon. That was fantastic. Well, we do have a qu another a question here from the audience. And so audience members, please type any questions you have or might develop into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window or, or the chat. We'll see them there too. But this one's from Jerry. Uh, Jerry says, I'm really enjoying knowing what we know, which is excellent, just as your prior books are. While in your book, you outline the significant reduction of printed newspapers and periodicals in the last few decades, 
Do you nevertheless foresee printed books being able to survive as repositories of knowledge in the future? I, well, what can I say other than yes, because that's how I earn my living, but also I fervently hope so. And, and the argument in a way is raging in a significant way over something that I've come to know relatively intimately, and that's the future of a printed version of the Oxford English Dictionary. At the moment, OED second edition is 20 volumes. Now all the other multi-volume works like Britannica and so forth have now died, they're all online. The OED is online still, but also is still in print. The third edition will come out in 20, 37. It'll have a million words at the moment, it's 600,000, give or take. It'll have a million words, and will it be in print? And the, the wise people at Oxford University Press say it will, it deserves to be. For a million reasons, not the least being that riffling through it encourages serendipity. You open two pages, which may have at the top left the word humorist, but well, actually, if it's at the bottom right, then you'll get humor and humoral and things which are utterly uh, unrelated, but are fascinating to discover. And from that, you enrich your spirit from, through serendipity, through verbal serendipity. So I pray that the OED remains in print. I think it will. And for similar reasons, I think most books will. I think, I mean, I think the sales of my books in hardback or you know, in paper form still hugely outstrip both audio and Kindle versions, which gives me great cheer. It's not to say that when I'm sitting on the subway and I see someone reading a Kindle, I want to snatch it from their hands and say, get a book because any, any exchange of information, particularly if it's, it's mine, I'm welcome. But um, so I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, and, um, but very hopeful. Wonderful. And the next oh. question comes from, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I just said I've stopped. So it was oh, an yes. <laughs> uh, the next question comes from Sarah. Um, and she would like to know, I'm wondering what avenues of research have you found to be most fruitful and how have your sources changed through your career? Has that change been for the better? Yes, well, the books I sort of started out doing involved a lot of travel when I was a sort of young person. So for instance, I wrote a book about um, called Outposts, which I think in this country is initially called The Sun Never Sets, but it was voyages to the last relics of the British Empire. I know the British Empire is a dirty phrase these days, but back in the 80s, I think it was the 80s that I wrote it, um, it wasn't quite as scrubby. And I went to all these places. So first-hand research by going to strange places like Tristan da Cunha and St. Helena and Gibraltar and Pitcairn Island, you had to physically go. And then when the book became, books became sort of rather more conceptual or sort of too vast to think you could go everywhere, like the meant United States or the Pacific or the Atlantic. Then a lot of it required going to universities that did research. So for instance, when I did the book on the Atlantic, I spent a lot of time at Woods Hole in Massachusetts and uh, at the University of Southampton, where they have a lot of people mapping the ocean and the, and the seafloor. And as the books become ever more complex, this, for instance, the, the knowledge book, I, um, I have to I say this in the, um, in the acknowledgements, I went virtually nowhere because COVID wouldn't allow it. And so I was doing a huge amount of reading. So I bought, I mean, with the FedEx man every day, bringing pile upon pile of books and my wife just going crazy where you could put them all, but also going to the foundational sources of any Wikipedia on, answer and going to the universities that are doing that research, but through emails and telephone calls and so forth. So it has changed qualitatively over the years. I don't travel nearly as much, although the next book, which I'm not going to really talk about, will require a lot of travel. Um, but uh, and then, of course, Wikipedia. I mean, hugely important and now more or less, more or less trustable. Thank you. There's a question here from Ezra. 
And he's wondering if, uh, he said he's, in school, he had always uh, heard that Diderot's encyclopedia had a major role. Do we still consider that uh, um, a sort of a foundational piece of the enlightenment of the encyclopedia? Yes, I mean, it was a huge multi-volume work of stunning beauty. I mean, it just, you look at the copy, look at the, the frontispiece of Diderot, uh, volume one, and I wanted to use it as the frontispiece for my book, but um, my editor didn't think so. I'm not quite sure why. It wasn't the first. There were earlier encyclopedias in both Britain and Germany, um, but the credit really goes to Diderot. But um, the thing about all printed encyclopedias, the big flaw that no one really um, realized until electronic encyclopedias took over, is that they're a snapshot in time of what people believe to be knowledge. And a classic example comes from the 11th edition of the Britannica, which is regarded as the, the greatest of all editions of Britannica. Uh, published in Chicago, edited by an Englishman called, called Hugh Chisholm, and beautiful, I mean, magnificent, except in certain issues, deeply wrong and deeply offensive. So if you find an 11th edition, which you can in most um, second-hand bookstores, I suggest you just look at the entry, for instance, for the word Negro. And it was written by a eugenicist, and it's eight pages of offensive nonsense. But that was taken as holy writ from 1928 to 1955, I think, when the, the 11th edition was the encyclopedia. So you have to be very careful. I mean, realizing that and, uh, that's just one egregious example, and actually it's so egregious was it that my editor did not want to put the first few paragraphs of that entry into the book, I wanted to show how appalling encyclopedias could be and huge thought influence as they are. Um, these days, of course, everything is edited all the time by the hive mind, by us. And although that may initially have, um, have caused some problems, the algorithms have tended to iron it out. And um, what appears in Wikipedia is up to date and pretty accurate but challengeable if it's not. So while I might mourn as someone who do believes that books do furnish a room, the end of these great encyclopedias, what appears today is generally speaking, correct. Thank you. Um, Steve asks, your career has been incredibly wide ranging, including detailed work on both history and science and all sorts of other topics. What was your academic background? I was a geologist. I, I took a degree in geology in 1966 and uh, from Oxford and went to uh, almost immediately to Uganda, working for a Canadian mining company in the foothills of the Ruanzori Mountains, um, looking for copper. And I was completely hopeless at it, didn't find any copper at all, and but read a book um, by a man called James Morris who was the London Times correspondent on the Mount Everest expedition that got to the top in 1953. And crucially, he was the one who sent the signal back to London, announcing Hillary and Tensing having succeeded in climbing to the summit and sending it such that it appeared in the London Times on the morning of the 2nd of June, 1953, which was the date of the Queen's coronation. It's odd to be talking about this because we've just had another one. Um, and I was completely enthralled by this book and I decided I didn't want to be wandering around the world with a hammer and a bottle of hydrochloric acid and a magnifying glass and a compass, but much rather go around the world with a pencil and a notebook. So I wrote to James and he, for the next 10 years of my life, was unbelievably helpful. But we didn't meet until the day I did meet him, I discovered he had turned himself into a woman and he had become Jan Morris and Jan and I remained the best of friends until she died 18 months ago. We wrote a book together. So it's a strange uh, progress, but um, as someone said to me the other day, if, anybody, if anyone asking for advice how to become a writer, you get a very bad degree from Oxford in geology and then make great friends with a transsexual. So I'm all for that. Wonderful, thank you. I, I, lo I love Jan Morris as well. So I have a question now. Yeah. 
uh, for, for Brian. So uh, I, I, as I said, I hosted Brian for uh, an event for We the Dead and I love the book, but, and I, I thought this would be a great connection because of the, the similarities of the work. And I think I know where this is going based in uh, some of the conversations, but Brian, can you tell me about uh, certain elements of knowing what we know that really connected with, with your research on uh, data? No yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> well, let's say there are, there are two main parts. One was Simon's deep attention to the material aspects of, of knowledge being turned into a book or a broadside or a newspaper. Um, if you haven't read Knowing What We Know yet and you're on this call, buy it immediately and read it. And I would, I would point you to this section where the, the art and the machinery, the mechanics of printing of movable type is described um, because you, you really can't deny after reading that that um, the, all the materials that go into making this this sort of abstraction called knowledge uh, sometimes that we can see as something that floats in our heads or something um, so I, I really appreciated the emphasis on those material aspects and um, connected to the the topic you were just discussing uh, geology and the role of the earth in all of this you know there's another moment in the book where you talk about um, papyrus emerging where it did in Egypt versus paper emerging where it did and sort of the role that the earth has, has to play. And I think I really identified as a writer with a lot of things that, that you do in this book uh, because there was definitely a time, I, I guess in the 18th and 19th century where there were some sort of egregious arguments being made about race, trying to account for racial differences through things like geology and climatology and things that, that we don't really hold to be scientific now, but I think that definitely within media studies, within the work that I do, um, and with you know, really brilliant work done by people like you, um, we recognize the role that the that the movements of the earth, that the layers of the earth, that the forces within the earth generate, and those those um, those geological forces, those biological forces, and those chemical forces all come together to really deeply condition not control or determine what the humans living on top of that ground do but very very much condition what those humans find themselves getting into uh and then and then shaping the again the material aspects of what they invent and what they they hold to be valuable or beautiful or whatever it, it may be i think there's a correlation between seismically active parts of the world and human creativity mm -hmm. i mean look at for instance in silicon valley right on top of one of the most mobile faults in the world, the San Andreas Fault. Look at Japan. Mm. I mean, a place riven with volcanoes and earthquakes. Amazing stuff going on there. And by contrast, I don't want to be rude to Nebraska or Kansas or places that are generally stable, but it would seem to me that people who are not living quite as much as on the edge as they are in, let's say, San Francisco or... Uh, of Tokyo, it, 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 there's a more placid nature of the intellectual life out there. Mm -hmm. And um, people that write about, uh, and I'm thinking of an author whose name escapes me, but who wrote about Nebraska. She did all her writing from New York City, not mm -hmm. Omaha. Well, I will say, speaking from, from uh, the Midwest as someone from Ohio, when it comes time to store all those brilliant works of art, and writings, they put them in the places with low seismic activity so that there doesn't destroy them. So uh, all of the <laughs> all the very vibrant places can create it and then well, we'll keep it safe. Good for you, thank you. <laughs> we are just about out of time, but we have one last question that I'd love to get in that was sent to me by Anna, um, who would like to know, was there anything that had to be cut from knowing what we know that you particularly regretted leaving out? Well, first of all, yes, about 20,000 words, because, I mean, I think the book is, what, about 150, so I think that I submitted about 175. And I did think, I, and I argued to this day, that, that the part from the Britannica that was so particularly um, illustrative of the racial mindset of, uh, of um, the editors back in the 1920s, that my editor, out of an abundance of prudence, I think, uh, said no, that can't appear in the book because it'll, it'll, um, it'll damage the, the the book. And I, I think probably she was right. I was willing to risk damage to the book, um, but 
so I do regret that. There are one or two other lesser things. I mean, I'm obsessed about uh, navigation and I put in a lot about celestial navigation being much more fun than GPS. Um, and that had to come out as well because I've done a lot of long distance sailing and wanted to reminisce about that, but she said, no, that's too self-indulgent. So that came out. So race and navigation, two things that there could have been more of in the book, but just my beastly editor took them out. Well, Simon, um, Brian, thank you both so much. This has been an absolute delight this evening. And uh, you can order the books from Northshire Bookstore or King's English, uh, whichever your local indie is. Thank you so much. And we'll see you again at another Northshire event in the future. It's been a pleasure from my point of view. Thank you for having me. Likewise. Thank you. Take care, everybody.